the sexual pleasure, in a way, it's one of the most beautiful parts of being a human, but it's one of the places where we bring the least parts of ourself to the conversation, to the engagement together. And I'm afraid that everybody kind of loses with that. This is the Rose Woman Podcast, provocations for living whole, happy, and free your whole life long. I'm your host, Christine Marie Mason, founder, philosopher, author, mama yogi, and in the context of this, someone who's deeply interested in how we as a culture overcome body shame, sexual shame, and just normalize this incredibly joyful part of our existence. Now, we get help from a lot of experts when there's a problem in our lives. Chiropractors for the back, therapists for our emotions, accountants for our finances. But what do you do when your particular concern is sexuality, a topic that is still shrouded in taboo? If you can't experience arousal or orgasm, or don't know how your own body or your lover's body works, would you be willing to get some coaching? Would you hire a sexual healer? And what is a sexual healer anyway? My guest today is Adam Hunter Bauer, who's been committed to healing through many modalities, including sacred sexuality, for almost 40 years. Now, there are a lot of flavors of people who do sexuality coaching, sexual surrogacy, sex therapy out there, and we're about to learn some of the differences. In this episode, Adam opens up about the tender task of helping women and couples feel and connect in this vital realm. Why do people come to you, or any sexual healer for that matter, in the first place? People sometimes recognize that there is room between where we are now and where our ideal expression of self could be, right? In in so many domains. Why would you go to a therapist? Why would you reach out to a personal trainer? Why would we work with anybody? Because we recognize that we can be more of ourselves. We can be more fully embodied, more aligned with our truth. And sometimes it's good to have someone who's not me to help me see what's between me and that ideal place, you know? So when people feel that there's room for their development in a sort of sexual or sensual embodiment or relational way, they might reach out to have some companionship along that journey. For me, the people I know who have tried it are often triggered by a relationship change, a divorce, uh, the ending of some kind of partnership, uh, or often by getting to mid mid age, middle age, and and thinking that they could be having more intense experience. And sometimes it's coming into awareness around their own trauma and withholds. Uh, do you have a sense of that? Well, I think all of the above are true. You know, we can. What it's a mysterious process. Ultimately, I think, at least to me. It's a mysterious process what it is that brings anyone to a threshold where we are ready to try something new, where we get finally, ultimately tired of the way we've been doing things, because we often find that it actually isn't working ideally. And so a breakup can do that for us, a sudden disruption of life energy or circumstance can sometimes shock us into a bit of a review, like what's working for me and what's not working for me. Am I satisfied and happy and delighted with where I am in this domain, in any domain? Or in fact, am I pretty sure I could be doing this better? I could be enjoying life more. I could be more open. I could be more true to myself. And, you know, any port in a storm, I think, whatever it is that gets us to any of us to that place where we're ready to grow, we're ready to invite something of an upgrade into the way we live, I think that can be used for good, even if it's painful in the getting us there. Did you have something like that in your own life? What brought you into this work? Well, I think I woke up. I mean, I'll say, first of all, that I, I have had a kind of an unusual life when it comes to my own sexuality. And uh, my first couple of tentative sexual experiences as, a, as an adolescent in high school were not particularly fulfilling or profound or satisfying. And I ended up deciding at age 18 to take 
my vows of celibacy and poverty and renunciation and live like a monk for several years from 18 to 21. And so when I came out of that, you know, here I was sort of trying to make my way in the material world, in the sexual world. And um, it's been quite an interesting adventure overall. But after 10 or 15 years, you know, in the fields of play out there, I kind of came to a realization slowly that I could do better at all this. I could be a better communicator. I could be a better lover. I knew I just I had this creeping realization that there was more for me to experience, more to give and more to receive. And so I started realizing there's work for me to do here. And that began the process of looking around to see, okay, where can one do this work? Because, you know, the space of sexuality is a little bit shadowy in most mainstream cultures. There aren't really obvious places to go. It's not really a yellow pages thing like, oh, I want to upgrade the way I am as a sexual being. Like, let me go to this place. So it took me a little while of exploring until I sort of found that there were some options, some some schools, some places, some programs, some teachers out there who were opening up these spaces for exploration and experiential investigation in the realms of the sensual and the sexual. And so I picked one of those and started going to workshops and teacher trainings because I wanted to learn and I was willing to accept that my teachers might not be perfect. Everything might not be perfect, but there was still plenty for me to learn. So I just started diving in. I think I just got frustrated with where I was. I knew I could be more and I wanted more. First training you went to, like? Um, you know, just always a little nerve wracking to walk into a workshop. It was a weekend workshop in Boston run by Charles Muir of the Source School of Tantra. And, you know, that's the typical mix of butterflies and excitement and nervousness and, you know, and trepidation um, because you never really know what you're going to run to in any workshop. And when it's a sexually themed one, you know, it, it seems to just raise the stakes for weirdness or the possibility of discomfort. But I found that there was something profoundly liberating, actually, in circling up with a room full of other tender, squishy, imperfect human beings like me and talking directly to material that had not really been tackled directly. I don't really remember my parents giving me much of a birds and bees, much less like a real, you know, more intimate sexuality speak when I was growing up. Sex ed classes in grade school and high school weren't that helpful. It's one of these black holes of the culture and so here I was in a room full of people who were talking about human sexual response, not the band from Boston, but actually just human sexual response and the possibilities for connecting and and human biology. Like, let's look at, you know, maps of a woman's yoni. Let's look at the labia. Let's look at the clitoris. Let's look at the biology and let's be explorers in this realm that has not been part of the public conversation. And so I found there was something really kind of delightfully, refreshingly normal about just gathering with people and being in the conversation rather than avoiding it or pretending that we didn't need to learn anything about all this. There was something very normal about it, actually. It went both ways, right? You look at both genders? Yes, for sure. I'm I'm thinking about my first experience with the uh, sky dancing tantra. I went to a class, and the first weekend was really about just playing and and dancing together and experiencing different kinds of touch. But then at one point, we sat down in a foursome, and everybody closed their eyes and was asked to strip down naked with their eyes closed in their foursome. And then when you opened your eyes, everybody had their clothes off. And then one at a time, people stood up and and talked about their own body. Like, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is what I'm ashamed of. And uh, the people ranged in age from 18 to 80. And I was, it was the first time that was just in this normal thing that you're talking about. You're just looking at a body. It's not an object of consumption. You're just sharing what you think. And I couldn't believe the criticisms people had of their own form. I didn't think any of the things that they criticized. And so can you talk a little bit about the relationship between body shame and sexual pleasure. 
I grew up in America. I'm an American. So in the culture that I grew up in, body shame is sold and marketed to us. And body pleasure is not really sold and marketed to us. You know, there's a range of industries and products that are designed to invite us to spend our hard earned money buying things to make us better. And so if we feel ashamed or if we feel unwhole or imperfect or broken or my hair's not blonde enough or my this isn't that enough, then we might keep buying and consuming stuff that, let's be honest, we basically don't really need. So the body shame is a social culturalization that is part and parcel of a kind of broken capitalist social framework that wants us to feel unwhole so that we can spend money trying to make ourselves more whole in ways that fundamentally will never really work. So the body shame is part of what we think of as normal because somehow it's part of this system that we're in, but it really isn't, it's a social construction body shame. Like there's no reason to feel ashamed. I mean, I got a little paunch more than I'd like right now. And sometimes we carry a little more weight or we're a little more this, we're a little more that, whatever, but there's no real reason that that should make us feel ashamed. And the sexual pleasure part, you know, is fascinating because, I mean, I grew up in New England in the East Coast. And so, you know, the land of the Puritans and the Puritan ethic was not one that leaned into sexual pleasure as a natural uh, part of human birthright and experience. So the sort of, again, the, the shame or the closeting of our nature as fleshy feeling pleasure seeking beings has just never really been, you know, part of the mainstream culture. And so we're often left to our own devices to figure that out, but our own devices are shaped by the culture that we're in, which is a culture of sexual shame on the one hand and using sex to sell us alcohol and food products and blue jeans and makeup and all the other things that aren't really useful for what they're being pitched as. And then when we come together in high school or in college, as we begin exploring our nature as sexual beings, and then really from there on out, how many relationships have we been in where talking about sexual preferences and yearnings and kinks and desires and fears and boundaries and shames and whatever, like how, how many of us have had really healthy exchanges like that with potential lovers? We don't tend to have that be an obvious part of the introduction of ourselves to each other. And so, and we all want to kind of front, we have a tendency, it's human nature, it's not totally bad, but it is a little bit ridiculous. You know, we have this tendency to sort of front ourselves as sort of more together, more accomplished maybe than we are. So to come to a potential lover and start, you know, I, 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 I want them to think that I'm fabulous and that I'm a skillful lover and that I know all the things and that, you know, we don't need to be having awkward conversations about things that are best avoided. You know, we just go right to the main event, right? We just like, we start making out, we start making love, we start doing things. And then we sort of discover along the way, but we usually don't talk about it. It's not usually a conversational space. And so the sexual pleasure is a, it's in a way it's one of the most beautiful parts of being a human, but it's one of the places where we bring the least parts of ourself to the conversation, to the engagement together. And I'm afraid that everybody kind of loses with that because that lack of curiosity or that shame that we have that keeps us from, you know, asking questions or revealing our own growing edges just makes everything a little bit more superficial and, and less potent than it could be if we were in a more open exploratory feeling with the people who we love. Mm, that, that leads me to wonder about the balance between talking to a client for you and hands-on work. What does a session look like with a DACA or a sexual healer? First of all, sessions can vary widely depending on the practitioner. So I, I can speak for myself, but I think depending on who one is working with, sessions you know might look very different. And it also, of course, depends hugely on 
the nature and the moment of the client who's coming in and ready for that work. So, I mean, every session generally would begin, certainly any any client engagement with a new uh, a new kind of working relationship would begin with words, with conversation about, you know, who are we and what are we here for? Like, what's the goal of this work? Who are you as a being that are coming to me? What are you seeking? What do you want to open or evolve in yourself? Are you trying to work through specific traumas? Do you have pain or discomfort? Do you have shame and guilt? Is it more sort of functional biology or is it dealing with old trauma that is living in the system and keeping a person from being able to fully access their own, you know, orgasmic, beautiful, loving, open, relational nature? So we talk for a while until we come to some sense of alignment about what the focus of the work is, like what is the purpose of our coming together? You know, once we ground into the deeper orientation of the person coming for the work, then the work, you know, it usually has a a prominent hands-on component. Uh, I, I come from a training of straight up therapeutic massage. That's how I I studied my first half dozen years or so was really about studying hands-on body work, nothing to do with sexuality. That was while I was a monk. So it was super nothing to do with sexuality. And, you know, if you've ever had transformational body work of any kind, um, then you know that it is very possible to start accessing some pretty deep and beautiful and sometimes challenging and painful material, because as they say, the issues live in our tissues. And so when we allow our bodies to be touched by someone else, then there's a sort of a magic that can happen in that contact that can allow and invite some of those stored stresses, tensions, and traumas in our cellular structure, in our muscular tissue to sort of loosen up and begin rising to the surface for potential release back into the wild. It doesn't need to live in us forever. I usually start with some level of just basic, good hands-on massage, just so that, so the bodies can come into contact and come into some sort of relationship. I'm a firm believer that it's not good to rush. There's no merit in speed. So some body work, get some hands-on happening there and let the bodies begin to speak to each other in a non-verbal kind of a way. And then, you know, the way the, the training that I had in the sexual healing work, um, put a certain amount of focus on internal yoni work, uh, sacred spot work, working the, the, the G spot inside a woman's yoni, um, with the understanding that in that way that the issues live in our tissues, there's actually, that is true to the nth degree around our sexual areas, that there's something about the, the, a woman's internal parts, especially that G spot area that hold not only the capacity for incredible pleasure and ecstasy, but also the trauma and pain and suffering of our previous life experiences. And unfortunately, we all have a pretty decent awareness, I think at this point, that women in modern culture have been the recipients of an extraordinary amount of abuse, abusive behavior, improper and incorrect uh, touch and social activity across so many spectra. So there are so many women who are holding suffering, pain, trauma inside their system. And so, you know, by the time you're doing internal work inside someone's body, whether in someone's yoni or doing anal work with fingers, or if you ever had anybody work inside your mouth, inside your jaw mm-hmm. tissues with the hands, there's an extraordinary amount of information and and stress and trauma that store in these tissues so it's extraordinarily delicate work and it's really crucial to come to that connection to that contact in a soft and a gentle and a loving way so that we are supporting someone's unfolding healing process and not in any way likely to further damage or inflame the situation by acting too abruptly or being insensitive mm-hmm. or if you know if if i'm as a as a practitioner if i'm trying to get my own needs met you know that's a disaster just waiting to happen so it's really important to be a hollow bone for the energy of 
of love and healing to come through us as practitioners to truly be there to serve the other person in what naturally arises. I do know some practitioners who are extraordinarily potent in their ability to run energy or, you know, give people orgasmic experiences or whatnot. It's not how I work. I really just pray that life works through me in whatever way is most of service to the person I'm working with. I'm not trying to create energy or give them this or, you know, I'm just allowing their process to unfold and I'm there to be a container for it, to be a witness for it and to pour my love through my body into their body and soul and pray for grace from there. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of conversations on Rosebud Woman Channel around opening up the pelvis and the hips, you know, getting spiral dynamics, like really circulating the hips, moving the hip bones, moving the tailbone, shaking, bouncing, waking up the by doing squats a few times every hour, just getting up and moving and getting blood flow, particularly for people who sit. And I remember one time being in a teacher training with Baron Baptiste, and he kept 80 people in the room in frog, which is this position that opens the groin really deeply, the whole hip area for 20 minutes. And spontaneously, about seven or eight minutes in, a dozen women began crying. And he was speaking to this exact thing, like every time you've had uh, resistance in your body to someone entering you or any kind of trauma or anything like that, that every time the body locked up around that experience, it remembered to lock up. And that that it started to associate that with an assault of some sort, whether that was a micro assault or something more major. And so this issues in the tissues thing um, is really the whole pelvic basin, not just inside the yoni, can help access that. So I want to ask you um, about something you just said about the practitioner trying to get their needs met. And I know you and I have had conversations in the past about finding uh, a, a clean practitioner, like clean energy around that. And it goes, it's the same with religious leaders and gurus. And, you know, how do you identify someone who is in it for an act of service or as a true healer versus someone who's a little bit in it for themselves? Well, I think that's the million dollar question, right? That's the challenge of anyone seeking to do this work is how can we find safe, self-contained practitioners who are truly in it for the service of their clients and not for their own ego gratification or physical gratification or as a pipeline for their own sexual satisfaction. And I wish I had an easy answer for that. Um, I think it's actually a complicated question. And it's kind of on the the borderline between legal and, and not legal. You're not really a sex worker, which is prostitution. You're not really a sex therapist, which is a licensed medical practitioner. You're in more of this space of like a very specialized life coach or something. <laughs> you know. So, But still, I don't think people are really uh, easy to find. I mean, you know, if you get on the Google and just start poking around for, you know, who is doing this work, sexual healers in my area or whatever, you'll, you'll, You'll come up with lists of some of the likely suspects of organizations that are out there, the various schools of Tantra, the various, you know, ISTA type organizations. And there's a number of folks who are out there practicing in this field. That doesn't really address the question of how you find someone with bulletproof integrity, because there's plenty of people who are drawn to, I mean, this is true, I think, of any real domain. You know, people are drawn to this space because we have healing to do for ourselves as practitioners, not because we've solved it all and now we're here to help other people. I mean, usually there's some component of of this work that is alive in the nature of people on all sides of the equation. And so you can find people who are associated with some of the uh, better known organizations or schools or names of practitioners, but that doesn't really guarantee you that they're clean practitioners because everybody's kind of doing their own work. And I think that's, it's a place where the person seeking a good practitioner has to really cultivate powerful discernment and really listen to their own intuition when it comes to the signals that they're getting 
the intuition that is coming to them when they're speaking with someone, when they're meeting with someone, because, um, because it, it's not like there's a list of 20 questions and if they're answered the right way, you know, you're safe. You know, there's a lot of wolves and sheep's clothing out there, not just in this space, but certainly in this space. And so someone can say a bunch of the right things, but they may not yet be entirely embodied in their ability to truly live all those things. And when we are putting ourselves under the hands and the tutelage of a practitioner in this most profound and sensitive and vulnerable area, our own sex, our own pleasure, our own pain and trauma, then it really matters who we find to work with. And so I think it's okay to say no thank you if you feel something is not quite right with a practitioner. Are there any of these particular schools or some of the organizations like the Sky Dancing Tantra People or ISTA that have a directory of some sort that people could look at? Yeah, and then I, even within that, I guess I guess you would look for recommendations. Yeah, I think there certainly are practitioner directories associated with some of the different, uh, you know, organizations, bodies out there. I mean, as you mentioned before, this is an unregulated space. But certainly a lot of these schools or organizations, people who are offering trainings, you know, definitely would have listings of people who have been certified in their in their stuff like the sexological bodywork um, community. You know, there's people who have put a substantial amount of time and effort into educating themselves and refining their own capacities as practitioners. And so that's at least a good place to start. You know, word of mouth is very helpful, but also sometimes difficult to access because if you're not from this world, then how do you know which mouths to get the words from, you know? And so, but I think certainly speaking with people and trying to, you know, get as much as possible a personal recommendation is helpful. And there are some great practitioners out there. Yeah, I don't want to scare everybody off, you know, by just sort of sharing, you know, the the potential for it's not always even unethical practitioners. It's just that we're all humans. We all are on our own learning curve. And this stuff is so deep, so profound, so tender that it's possible that our shadow sides come out in ways that can be deleterious to the benefit of our, you know, the people we work with. And, and mm -hmm. we just don't, we don't want that kind of experience. You know, we want a clean, yeah. healthy experience. But I think for the person who's interested in this work, there's got to be a way that to craft a clear agreement with the practitioner. If you're doing like an interview and understanding where they're at and, and how far they want to go, I mean, how do you do a boundary and agreement conversation in a space where people are damaged, I guess. It sounds, it must be so artful. What do you look for? It's an extraordinary trust. I mean, it's no, it's ultimately, it's not really different from being a doctor or being a, a psychotherapist or even being fiduciary, you know, from another model. Like it is baked into the situation that, that there is someone coming to you who is in need of something and it is our duty to offer that in as clean and present and effective and of service way as we can. And, and that's the priority. Yeah, I and, think that's true. But if I'm standing, if you've put yourself in the shoes of a, of a, a customer, a client, a yeah. patient, whatever. Yeah. Then, you know, like if there's a fiduciary, a sexual fiduciary or a physical healer or a therapist or a coach or something, I generally have kind of an understanding of what is going to happen there. And so I'm hiring for services that are pretty well documented and I sure. can, I have taxonomies and checklists of things I can pull from that. But if people go into this area because it's so shrouded in secrecy, you know, I, I just wonder how you, come to an agreement, how I as a customer or a client will come to an agreement with a practitioner on what services and boundaries I have. Yeah. Like, what do uh, I ask them? What do uh, I ask them to assess if they're impeccable or or to feel into their groundedness? Like I'm not a very good reader of those things in, in some cases or and somebody who's new at it certainly would be vulnerable to being a bad reader of, of, of the practitioner, I guess. 
Sure. I think that's always, you know, I mean, for any of us, you know, some, some people are very charming and engaging when we first meet them, but it turns out that time reveals a different feeling or a different energy. And so, you know, the, the, the power of our individual discrimination and our own spidey sense to read into, you know, is this a place that I can do this work? And it's not even, I was going to say, is this a safe space? But it's not even really about being a safe space, right? Because the work is traumatic and the memories are intense and the experiences of reliving these things or doing this work, you know, they're not easy. We're not coming to it because it's a parlor game or it's a, a, a fun uh, evening of entertainment. We're coming in because it's because it's very heavy work in in some cases. I mean, sometimes it's all pleasure and ecstasy and rippling cur energy currents that, you know, ripen people and help them feel alive, you know. But along the way to that also, there can be some pretty, you know, dark corners to scrunch around in. And sometimes that stuff, you know, can hurt. You know, they laughed, they cried, they bought the T-shirt. You know, it's a it's a full spectrum experience where it's a challenge. We have, we have, we have to be up for doing that work and, and we need practitioners, you know, who are not afraid of the pus and the grime and the projections and all the things that are necessary to, to take on or to experience or to witness as this work kind of unfolds. Um, I like the idea of rippling pleasure. I don't like the idea of pus and grime, I have to say. Exactly. But, but you, you know, know, you sort of have to sort of take the, take the, the juice with the, with the dry. In terms of your earlier, you know, the, the first part of that question of, you know, how do we approach those kind of negotiations with practitioners? I mean, I think just like we would with any <clears throat> other place, actually, I mean, the, the fact that it's a somewhat shadowy realm of practice due to, you know, the legal status of some elements of this or the social opprobrium that, um, you know, sometimes attaches to things that are a little bit more edgy in personal behavior or sexuality, the fact that those things are true doesn't mean that when we find these people or these situations that um, we don't, you know, get to revert back to, you know, how we play in real life, which is that, you know, if you and I have a project we want to do or some kind of a, you know, something that we're thinking of engaging on, it's, it's completely typical and expected that we could talk about what this means to us. So if I'm a practitioner and I'm really clear that I've got certain boundaries, at least in the first couple of meetings, because X, Y, and Z, then, you know, it, in a, to, a, to a degree, it's on me to, you know, share that with the practitioner. I mean, a good practitioner will help draw that out and will make sure that, I mean, a typical conversation, you know, in the training I was doing years and years ago, you and I think in almost every training, there's some version of this where you look at, you know, the BFD, right? The Boundaries, fears, and desires, the BFD. Um, so, you know, what are, what are the boundaries that uh, are important for the person who's coming to be held in the work? What fears do they have about the situation or about their, you know, condition or dynamic or the moment? And then, you know, desires that people have, like affirmative directions that people are looking to grow into or embody or explore or know about themselves. And so, you know, there, there's always, there, there should always basically, um, in, in a, in a structured official session, um, there should always be some sort of coming to meet around, you know, who are we, who's here, what are we here to do? How are we going to hold this? And, you know, the, the work happens within a container and that container is, is held with, with principle. Yeah. I could imagine too, that some spouses or partners might not get it. There might be some jealousy. Do you ever experience that? It's one of the most common of the sort of extra session dynamics in a way um, that, you know, often when people have partners, this is, this can be a real issue. You know, it's a, it's a rare partner or spouse who, um, who might not have some feelings emerge as a result of a conversation like this taking place. You know, they might be like, well, what, how come you can't do that work with me? Or like, I'm your partner, so let me hold that container for you. Or, or jealousies, or wait, you're going to go let this person touch you in that way? Like, that's definitionally sexual. What do you mean this isn't sexual? Or like, grumble, grumble. There's all kinds of, I mean, uh, yes, that's a very common, and I don't mean grumble, grumble in a, in a dismissive way. I mean, you know, there's some legit issues there and of course all feelings are legit and so it's it's not at all uncommon that um, well it's got to tap into like a partner's sense of sexual adequacy and if it's not framed in the same way like like you know if you you can have a conversation with your husband or wife um or you can go see a psychotherapist 
who's trained in mining and teasing out the underlying concerns and in through talk therapy, I would make parallels with that. Like yeah. it's not the same as making love with your spouse. It's like I'm going to someone who's trained in teasing out underlying issues in my body and in my tissues, as you said. Right. So I think that that I would I would say preparing for it and even inviting perhaps your partner into the conversation of setting up the meeting if that is a concern. Do you mm. think that's helpful? Well, I, I do. Um, if it's if it feels helpful to each per person in the partnership, um, then I'm all for that, and I think that's great. Um, I'll go you one step farther. Uh, it's not that uncommon um, at all for partners to come and be part of um, of the sessions because sometimes there are relational aspects of this, or or the the material that's being worked on is directly relational in nature. And so it can actually be very relevant, very helpful, um, and very indicated for a person's partner to come along also. You know, I've worked with couples where there was some stress in the relationship between the man and the woman uh, around the quality of their sexual touch and connection together. And, and um, the one partner is feeling sensitive in certain ways and not feeling like the other partner uh, was really meeting her in a kind of quality of touch that she needed. And so, you know, it, when, when there was a positive piece of session work that she and I had done together, she asked if she could invite her uh, partner to join us so that, you know, he could be part of the conversation. And also, you know, maybe I could show him a few things about, um, you know, ways to touch or, um, or, or different sort of energetic or moods that he might um, try to tap into when they're in intimate contact and that then and that ended up you know being a session and often can be a beautiful opportunity for people to for for a couple two people in a couple or however many people in a throuple or quipple um to connect together in intimate ways not to entirely outsource that process but to be involved in a way to say hey this person can help us we can learn something or we can you know, like having a witness, I mean, of course, having a trained person is its weight, worth its weight in gold, but sometimes having any witness who's quiet and kind and compassionate can help upgrade a process or a way that we kind of do things uh, lifted a little bit out of the familiar. And so it not only, you know, is it good to have a, a husband or boyfriend or partner involved in the conversation, uh, sometimes, sometimes if it feels true to each person, that could be work that shows up in the session space itself. I I haven't done this work in a long time. I did a lot in the 2000 and the early 2010s. And then I it kind of caused some problems in my life. I couldn't really integrate the work very well into my life. And so it took me a long time, other than doing sort of daily practice to keep my body open, to decide to go back in for another round. And this time it's not physical at all. I'm working with um, my own power. I'm working with like dominance and hitting things. Like I can't, I found myself in a Kung Fu class, ironically, and unable to even do the exercise with a partner in an approved and safe container where I could punch my partner. I could throw a punch even as a game without laughing. And it really got me to understand like how little uh, agency or aggression was available in my body um, that I had to, I was so afraid of my own power that I couldn't e express it even in a safe place. And so I'm, I'm doing a new piece on just four sessions, just on expressing power, asking for what I want um, and, and kind of a little dominance work. And I'm excited to start that. Uh, so I don't think it's always like um it's not always like a retroactive looking like I'm not happy or I'm not content. It's just like, oh, there's something where I'm stuck. So so I feel like you could do it on a lot of levels. You know, it's interesting, too, because this topic of sexuality and sexual healing is one, um, you know, clear domain where it's out enough of the mainstream that it can be difficult to sort of find our comfort zone with the explorations or the self-expressions. But as you're speaking to, there's plenty of other areas in life that are like that, right? Our anger, our resentments and frustrations to like violence is generally looked down on. But like you're saying, like, I can't even throw a punch, you know, in this safe container where we're supposed to be working on this. Like it shows how many places we are not really developed in our expression and our comfort zone 
around certain things. So we tend to marginalize or shadow out certain expressions because they're not really polite. You know, I'm not supposed to get angry. Um, and true, anger can be really destructive and horrible, but, but to not be able to get angry ever is a shadow of its own sort, you know, to not be able to express my frustration or resentment ever doesn't really work either. We need healthy ways to feel and experience and express the full spectrum of our emotional possibilities rather than just chalk a bunch of stuff up to that's always unsafe. That's always not allowed. I'm not able to even go there. So I'm going to just bury all that stuff and try to never be angry, never be frustrated, never be resentful, never be upset. But that's not real. Ooh. That's not possible. Yeah. I think this, since the, the, the sub themes of the, all these shows are from taboo to liberation, I probably will do one on anger and power in women and, and, uh, and expressing desire and letting that come up and be a fuel in the future. Well, I adore you. I just think that you have been such an ally in becoming more liberated, um, for me for a decade or more. And I love that you are combining the work of devotional practice, you know, singing and bringing people into this really open heart space uh, with other kinds of healing modalities, whether it's working with the I Ching or whether it's doing the sexual healing. And I just think it's pretty remarkable that you bring all of these things to bear. Sexuality is a vital part of life for all but the few truly by design asexual people. For most of us, it's an area of connection and joy and pleasure that we can tap into our whole lives long. Connect with your body, connect with your breath, unwind old stories, heal trauma in the body, explore new ways of touching and being present, and see what opens up for you. And possibly, no matter what our mothers might think, we might reach out to someone who's devoted a part of their lives to gaining knowledge to help us out here. DACAs, Dakinis, sex therapists, sex surrogates, sexual healers. If you want to talk to Adam directly, you can reach him at IamAdamBauer.com or at IamAdamBauer on Instagram. Thank you for letting us into your day. If you love this episode and know someone who would benefit from hearing Adam's wisdom, then pause and text that person the link to this show. And if you want more information for yourself on sensuality, sexuality, freedom, love, I have a lot of articles and books in my intimate wellness and body care collections at rosewoman.com. Come on over. I'd love to meet you. May you be happy and may you be free. Mm -hmm.